This is Law of Attraction Explored. I'm Tim Grimes. If you'd like a free guide that explains the hidden link between relaxation and the Law of Attraction, or if you want more information about my books or my coaching, you can visit RadicalCounselor.com. Enjoy the episode. So just relax yourself. If you're sitting or lying down, feel free to close your eyes or keep them open. Or if you're walking or going somewhere, just allow yourself to relax as you do what you're doing. So often what we talk about in this podcast is simply coming back to right now. The moment. Over and over again, we can return to this present place of abundance, which is right here. As Abraham Hicks say, your point of power is in the present. That's some very, very sound advice. Our point of power is in the present. Yet it's seemingly so easy for us to replace this experiential process of recognizing the power we have right now. Right now. Right now. Replacing that power with an intellectual narrative of what it means. Over the last half year or so, I've seen so many instances on social media and elsewhere of completely unnecessary narratives. Completely unnecessary mind trips and ways of looking at this relatively straightforward law of attraction information. Because this information, as we've gone over again and again, often is in its essence, relatively straightforward. It can be difficult to apply, but the message is often very simple and straightforward. Just like this idea that your point of power is in the present. And so often I've seen people create these narratives out of these ideas. And of course, I'm guilty of this too. We create narratives out of these various popular LOA concepts and ideas. For instance, some of these ideas that we see these narratives being made out of often on social media these days are Neville's everybody is you pushed out or things about assuming a state or something like what we just said Abraham Hicks always tells us to do. Your point of power is in the present. We create a storyline, a narrative, in intellectual exploration of these ideas. And then we often miss the point of what they're pointing at, at their profundity when we do that. We water down the power of a message like everybody is you pushed out or your point of power is in the present when we do that. So many of these ideas have to be felt with the body, not just with the mind. This can't be a mind-only type of practice. This has to be something we experience. And we have to experience it with our body, as well as our mind, with our whole being. A helpful way to look at this is to be aware of our tendency to become too overly dependent on our mind and too unaware of our body and to work on gently correcting that over and over again, so we can stay more powerful in this present moment, so we can stay more truly abundant and peaceful in this moment. And again, it's a moment-to-moment practice. But so often we fall victim of what is often labeled as spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing is a phrase Some of you have probably heard. It's a phrase, honestly, that I had heard many times, but I never really looked into what the term meant until recently. And it's worth looking at this concept. It's very similar to what 
we sometimes call spiritual materialism, which is a term that Chagyam Trungpa, the Tibetan Buddhist teacher, often spoke about in the 1970s. Spiritual bypassing is a concept that can help us to better understand our tendency to disconnect from the present moment and to become too intellectually immersed in an idea instead of experiencing it with our whole mind and body. And a book that I almost want to say is a definitive book on the subject because there really haven't been that many books written about it is a book simply titled Spiritual Bypassing, When Spirituality Disconnects Us from What Really Matters by Robert Augustus Masters. I want to just read a couple of short excerpts from the beginning of this book because it will help you see what I'm getting at and understand the value in recognizing when we are spiritually bypassing. Masters titles this first chapter, Avoidance in Holy Drag, an introduction to spiritual bypassing. And he writes, Spiritual bypassing, a term first coined by psychologist John Wellwood in 1984, is the use of spiritual practices and beliefs to avoid dealing with our painful feelings, unresolved wounds, and developmental needs. It is much more common than we might think, and in fact is so pervasive as to go largely unnoticed, except in its more obvious extremes. Part of the reason for this is that we tend not to have very much tolerance, either personally or collectively, for facing, entering, and working through our pain, strongly preferring pain-numbing quote-unquote solutions, regardless of how much suffering such quote-unquote remedies may catalyze. Because this preference has so deeply and thoroughly infiltrated our culture that it has become all but normalized, spiritual bypassing fits almost seamlessly into our collective habit of turning away from what is painful as a kind of higher analgesic with seemingly minimal side effects. It is a spiritualized strategy not only for avoiding pain, but also for legitimizing such avoidance in ways ranging from the blatantly obvious to the extremely subtle. Spiritual bypassing is a very persistent shadow of spirituality, manifesting in many forms, often without being acknowledged as such. Aspects of spiritual bypassing include exaggerated detachment, emotional numbing and repression, overemphasis on the positive, anger phobia, blind or overly tolerant compassion, weak or too ponderous boundaries, lopsided development, cognitive intelligence often being far ahead of emotional and moral intelligence, debilitating judgment about one's negativity or shadow side, devaluation of the personal relative to the spiritual, and delusions of having arrived at a higher level of being. Now all of these aspects of spiritual bypassing, if we consider them, and if we've been into these law of attraction ideas for long enough, I think we'll recognize if not in ourselves, in many of these aspects we probably can recognize as having uh, been afflicted with ourselves at times, but if not in ourselves, in the very least in others. In these New Age circles, which the law of attraction is so often associated with, it's so common to see people try to, one could almost say, escape their lives by applying these ideas like everybody is you pushed out, or your point of power is in the present, and clearly not really understanding what they are saying. A little bit later on in this introduction, Masters writes, True spirituality is not a high, not a rush, not an altered state. It has been fine to romance it for a while, but our times call for something far more real, grounded, and responsible something radically alive and naturally integral, something that shakes us to our very core until we stop treating spiritual deepening as something to dabble in here and there. Authentic spirituality is not some little flicker or buzz of knowingness, not a psychedelic blast through or a mellow hanging out on some exalted plane of consciousness, not a bubble of immunity, but a vast fire of liberation an exquisitely fitting crucible and sanctuary, providing both heat and light for the healing and awakening we need. 
another way of looking at that is that you can't mess with this moment. This moment is now. This moment is now. And when we try to label it and put it in a box too much and create a whole philosophy and way of being by doing that, we usually severely limit the effectiveness of these principles, whether they be law of attraction principles or general spiritual principles and ideas that have been shared for eons. And it would do most of us a lot of good to be honest with ourselves and to ask ourselves, are we spiritually bypassing more than we care to admit?